So as Dr. McAdams uh, showed, an exciting new application area of numerical methods and scientific computing for partial differential equations, or PDEs for short, is the visual effects industry. The major application of these techniques is for dynamics of complicated phenomena such as smoke motion, fire motion, splashing liquids, dust moving around in the air. Also sort of less obvious ones are clothing dynamics, hair dynamics, even skin and soft tissue dynamics, and more recently things like sand and snow. And the way that partial differential equations come into play for these kinds of phenomena is through uh, classical physics, where we use Newton's laws to write down partial differential equations that describe uh, basic force balance over a continuum. So the way that we get the governing equations from the classical physics is to start with force balance, where we say that the inertia or mass times acceleration is going to be balanced by the mechanical response in the form of a force here. When we write this for a fluid, we're going to tend to write it down in Lagrangian form, where we say that the rho or Lagrangian mass density times this material derivative of the Eulerian velocity is going to be balanced by the gradient of the pressure in the fluid, which is there to maintain this incompressibility constraint. By the incompressibility constraint, we just mean that the fluid is going to tend to preserve its volume and the pressure is going to be there as this force that's keeping that happening. Now, when we write down the solid equations, it's not going to be the same mechanical response. So we tend to write that down in a Lagrangian frame. It's the same equations, but just pulled back to a different reference. And again, we have a mass density this time. The Lagrangian mass density times Lagrangian acceleration is going to balance the divergence of first piola kirchhoff stress conception of uh, mechanical response. To have these... Uh, conceptions of the physics practical for making a movie effect, we have to be able to solve these governing equations, and that's where the scientific computing and numerical approximations come in. So I'm going to talk about how we solve the fluid equations, and specifically how we derive a Poisson equation for the pressure that ends up being the main bottleneck when we're running these kinds of simulations. So when we take our fluid equations, we're going to split it up into two stages. The first stage is an invection stage where we ignore the pressure temporarily. And then in a second phase, we're going to reintroduce the pressure to satisfy the incompressibility constraint of the fluid. And the way that we do that is basically you take the divergence of this equation and you require that the divergence of the time n plus 1 velocity should be zero. So the implication on that is that this Poisson type equation for the pressure has to balance the divergence that we saw in the intermediate velocity from the first step. And so now we can solve this equation using well-known Poisson techniques for complicated domains. So in practice, when we want to solve for the governing equations for fluids like this and solve for the Poisson equation for the pressure, the scenario is that we have a fluid in a realistic environment, which means that it can be a water surface where the water is approaching the air or water flowing past in a regular shape. We're going to get different boundary conditions where the fluid hits these different materials. And that's going to complicate the process of solving for the pressure because it basically says we're doing it in this strange geometry. The way that we're going to see that is we're going to see a Dirichlet boundary condition on the pressure at the air, which means that the fluid pressure has to match the air pressure at the water-air surface. And we're also going to see a Neumann-type boundary condition on the pressure where we specify the normal derivative of the pressure to be zero where it hits the solid. So to solve for the pressure in a complicated domain of this type, we have to have some discretization of the geometry of the domain. And we tend to use uh, relatively structured discretizations of the space to facilitate uh, rapid solution of these equations. And the most basic way to discretize in a regular shape is to voxelize it. And you can think of that as like we have this bounding box containing the fluid, and we're going to act like that bounding box is constructed out of these regular cubes or like Lego type pieces. And then for every Lego that we have in that cube, we're going to say, okay, that Lego is either water, air, or solid. And for every water Lego, we're going to have a pressure equation that we have to solve. And that equation is going to be modified slightly if an adjacent Lego is air or solid, but it's going to amount to a linear system, and we can write it down in the following way. So we take our pressure equation in the case of constant density, which is the most common case, that the Laplacian of the pressure is going to equal rho over delta t times the divergence of our u star velocity. And we're going to discretize this 
on a given voxel by looking at the adjacent voxels. So if I look at voxel ij, I'm going to get my pressure equation by looking at, in two dimensions, the four adjacent pressure voxels. And with this structured representation of the domain, we can get a simple approximation of Laplacian. So when we replace the Laplacian with this numerical approximation of the Laplacian, we get an unknown for every pressure uh, in a fluid voxel. And so this amounts to a linear system of equations rather than a partial differential equation that we have to solve to get our numerical result. So when we're solving this in practice, we want the number of pressure samples, uh, which I'll refer to as n, to be as large as possible. That's going to control the visual quality of the simulation. You can think of that as being analogous to the numbers of pixels in an image, right? If you have a larger number of pixels, the image is going to look better. If you have a low number of pixels, the image is going to look worse. So it's analogous for voxels here. If we run the simulation at a very low number of voxels, it's going to look artificial. It's going to look as if it was not quite real. Now, if we crank n up large enough, it's going to start looking indistinguishable from reality in the best case. Unfortunately, that's going to require n to be in the hundreds of millions in some scenarios. And that's a significantly difficult problem to uh, solve when you're talking about numerical linear algebra, solving these linear systems in practice. Not only is it difficult to solve one of these systems on its own, we're going to have to solve these systems at least 30 times per second to generate a frame of the movie. Uh, so we want to uh, open this up to basically numerical linear algebra research to try to speed this process up as much as possible so that it's art directable. Now, the branch of scientific computing concerned with solving linear systems of equation of the pressure uh, is satisfying is referred to as numerical linear algebra. And here we develop different types of algorithms for uh, approximating the solution of these linear systems. Many of these techniques are iterative in the sense that we start with an initial guess and we iteratively improve the initial guess in a process that would ideally converge to the exact solution. Now, there's a wide range of choices in iterative method that we can use for approximating the solution uh, to the linear system. The problem is to choose the one that's going to give us the best performance for the types of matrices we get for pressure Poisson equations. Now, in general, the complexity of the algorithm is going to depend on the structure of the matrix. So if the matrix is unsymmetric, that's basically the worst case going to take a long time. If the matrix is symmetric, that's a major improvement in the types of performance we can expect. And in the best case, when the matrix is symmetric and positive definite, or the SPD case, we can use very, very fast algorithms for approximating the solution. Now, the iterative method that makes the most sense in the case of a symmetric positive definite matrix is a uh, Krylov subspace method, um, specifically the conjugate gradient method. And the way a Krylov subspace method works is to first observe that we can write the right-hand side as a linear combination of m of the eigenvectors. On top of that, we know that the solution is going to lie in the mth Krylov space. Now, the idea is to start with an initial guess of zero and iteratively improve our approximation by taking our xk and getting an xk plus one that is the minimizer over the Krylov space of the error. So we're saying that xk plus one is going to be the best vector in the, in the k plus first Krylov space, uh, in the sense that it has the smallest error. And it turns out we can do that efficiently. And of course, by the time we get to xm here, we know that that should be the solution to the linear system. Now, it turns out we can make this process of uh, updating the iterate more efficient by using a different basis for the Krylov space. We want to use an a orthogonal basis. So we want to have these p vectors that are a orthogonal but also span the Krylov space. Now, they're A orthogonal in the sense that PI transpose A, P, J is zero when I is not J. And this is going to be helpful because I can write my next iterate as a simple increment to my previous iterate in the direction of the next P vector. So now the only question is, uh, well, how do I generate this new basis for the Krylov space? And then how do I get the optimal step? It turns out that the p vectors can be updated efficiently from the residual. So the residual is just defined as how close we are to solving the equations. So b minus a x k minus 1 is r k minus 1, where x k minus 1 was our previous iterate. And we're going to get p k by just 
incrementing that residual in the direction of the previous P. And it turns out that the increment for the P can also be conveniently written in terms of the residual, which again is something that's easy for us to get a hold of. Lastly, it turns out that alpha K can also be conveniently defined in terms of the residual. So in this way, we have a simple recipe that we can follow to take an initial guess, which in this case we're taking as zero, and just slowly march through the Krylov spaces with a simple uh, step away from our previous iterate. And in doing this, we know that we would converge after m iterations. So in practice, we're not going to run this all the way until convergence. So we're not going to run this all the way until we've hit the Krylov space that contains the solution. We're going to run this until the residual is below a tolerance. The factor that controls the convergence rate of the uh, method is the what is called the condition number, which is the ratio of the largest to smallest eigenvectors of the matrix A. The larger the kappa is, the longer it's going to take for us to solve these linear systems. So we hope that kappa would be relatively low. And just to look at this in another way, if I plot the residual as a function of the iteration count, I know that it's always going to be going down as I uh, increase my iteration. So it starts at some value. It's going down, 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 down. We know that by the time we hit M here, it'll shoot all the way down to zero because we'll have reached the maximum Krylov space. Uh, but in practice, basically, we're going to want to stop sometime before we got M. Uh, hopefully, the residual just gets small enough that we're happy with it. So imagine applying this method to two different matrices, A1 and A2. If I got kappa 1, which is the condition number of matrix A1, and it's larger than kappa 2, which is the condition number of matrix A2, that means it's going to converge a lot faster for matrix A2. So we hope that we have a matrix with relatively small condition numbers, so we're in the, the latter category here. Now, it turns out we can take advantage of this uh, property of the method and design an equivalent system that has a better condition number. So basically, we can manipulate the system without changing the solution to shrink the condition number. And in doing this, it's going to guarantee that we get uh, convergence in significantly fewer iterations. And so we're going to use this idea called preconditioning to manipulate the condition number in a way that's going to let us satisfy this constraint. And so how do we do that? We take a matrix P, which approximates the inverse of A, which is also symmetric positive definite. Now that matrix P, because it's symmetric positive definite, can be written as F, F transpose. Now we don't have to explicitly form this F, F transpose decomposition, but it turns out that it's easy to apply the conjugate gradient algorithm to this matrix, this matrix equation F, A, F transpose Y equals F, B, where we design this P to minimize the condition number. So specifically, we want the condition number of FAF transpose to be significantly less than the condition number of our original matrix. But of course, if we can solve the second system, we're done because we know that F transpose Y would be equal to X for our original system. So this is where basically the research comes in because we have the general idea of the algorithm, the, the Krylov conjugate gradient algorithm, we just now have to come up with this matrix P that's specifically tailored to the pressure equations that we have in the sense that it can squeeze the condition number down to satisfy our constraints. I can reach my tolerance with no more than 10 iterations. So in practice, when we run the unpreconditioned conjugate gradient algorithm, we'll see that it takes on the order of hundreds to thousands of iterations to converge to satisfactory residual tolerance. However, if we use a number of different preconditioners, we can get much better results. So the incomplete Cholesky preconditioner, which is a generic preconditioner, will converge in about 300, which is still not satisfactory. However, with uh, a little bit of research into the subject and a preconditioner that's designed specifically for this case, we can cut the number of iterations down to seven and uh, meet the result that will give us um, simulations on the order of hours. So as the demand for realism grows in the visual effects industry, we're going to see that more and more techniques of this type are absolutely essential, which makes it a very exciting time for applied mathematicians. <laughs>